It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together under the principle of freedom. We thank you for that freedom that many in the world do not have. We thank you for this opportunity. And may God the Holy Spirit give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the word into our souls so that we can build upon our edification complex and we can come to glorify you. In whose name we pray, amen. Now we noted how Satan is the enemy of Israel. That's very important. It's something we note today. All anti-Semitism is satanic. And we note that because the whole world hates Israel. The whole world plus a little less than half of Americans. That's phenomenal. That shows you the deceitful web. Why would a whole world hate one race? What would cause an entire world to hate one race of people and one little nation, almost the size of Rhode Island, a little bigger, I guess, smaller than New Jersey, one little nation, maybe half the size of New Jersey. I'll have to look that up. Is it? Okay. Well, what would cause a whole world to hate New Jersey? What would cause the whole world to hate... Israel. I could find more reasons to hate New Jersey than Israel. What would cause that? Satanic propaganda. And that's what has occurred all throughout the world and even in our own country. Now we've been a haven of the Jews and we still are as a result. We've been blessed. And oftentimes we've been probably shielded from attack because of our divine viewpoint related to Israel and many people in the south support Israel I don't know so much about the northeast but definitely people in the south support Israel there's more believers and more people who have at least some sense of what the Bible has to say about his chosen people now Satan is also the enemy of all unbelievers this comes out in 2 Corinthians 4 3 through 4 turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 4 3 through 4 2 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4 says, well, actually, I, let's see, I wrote this uh, down twice. Let's see where it be. Maybe this is uh, verse 3 here. He blinds the minds of all unbelievers. Okay, if our gospel be hidden. If our gospel be hidden, it is hidden to them that are lost in whom the God of this world, that's Satan. Who's the God of this world? Satan. If our gospel be hidden, what's the gospel? The gospel of Jesus Christ is our Savior. If our gospel be hidden, it is hidden, hidden to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, Satan, has blinded the minds of those who believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. There you go. Satan blinding the way of salvation. He's done that through works and everything else. He's done that in this country. The big invite Christ into your heart movement, that is satanically inspired, and that might shock some people. I know it would shock most of the Baptists in the world. But this movement of invite Christ into your heart and you'll be saved is satanic. Why? It is not in the Bible. Look it up for yourself. If you find it, if you find a verse, email it to me. You won't find it. I've issued this statement for over a year and a half now, and no one has challenged me on it. Why? It is not in the Bible. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. No invite Christ into your heart. No feeling with it either. People are so confused, and they're confused by Satan. And there are many people who think they're saved, but they're not. The only thing they've ever did in their whole life was invite Christ into their heart. And if that's all they've ever did, they're going straight to hell. 
It's a sad fact, one that shocks many people because they have been seduced into the satanic system and people who have been seduced into the satanic system are easily shocked by the truth. Why? They believe the lie. And since they believe the lie, the fact that somebody gives them the truth shows them that they were wrong and people are so arrogant today, they don't want to be wrong. They've got to be right. This pastor has to be wrong somehow. They've got to be right. Well, maybe the Bible doesn't say it, but I feel that way, they'll start saying. And then they'll start saying, well, it doesn't matter about what the Bible says. It's just how I feel. And that's the way people have gone today. Feelings. Feelings over the Bible. Feelings over what Jesus Christ himself has to say. It's unbelievable. But that's satanic propaganda. And that's unbelievable. The stronghold that he has on the world and this nation today is unbelievable. We have entered into a time of extraordinary apostasy. And every time the world enters into a time of extraordinary apostasy, disaster is on the horizon. And I tell you this, my pastor said this for many, many years, 50 years actually, disaster on the horizon. It is. He just had a little more foresight than most people. He said in the 1970s and 80s, terrorism is on the horizon. Well, it's not being a prophet. It's being able to interpret history on the basis of the Word of God. And that's all. It's no, no gift of prophecy today. Just being able to interpret history on the basis of knowing what the Word of God has to say about it all. And we're on the brink. We are skating on some thin ice. One day we're going to wake up and we're going to have a sad day. Unless believers get with the word of God and it's not happening. They're too arrogant. They will not submit to authority. They will not learn the word of God because they refuse to submit to authority. As a result, punishment, punishment, punishment. People get competitive rather than just being able to sit down and listen, period. Just sit down and listen and keep your mouth shut and go home when you feel like it, but keep your mouth shut. People can't do that. Arrogance! Arrogance! But they don't see it that way, obviously. Second Thessalonians 2, 7-10 through 10, adds some more reasons as to why people remain unbelievers. Second Thessalonians 2, 7-10 through 10, now, you don't have to turn there because I'm not going to go through it. We've been through it several times. But it talks about miracles. And unbelievers are impressed with miracles and they will be un impressed with Satan during the tribulation when he goes into, into the miracle performing business. Not only are they impressed then, but they're impressed now when Satan goes into the miracle performing business among uh, some tongues groups. Some. Most of it's a hoax. There are a few, though, that are definitely under some satanic possession and power. And they produce these false miracles or a bag of tricks. Just a bag of tricks. They might as well watch uh, Chris Angel, the new magician who has a bag of tricks. It's all tricks. He says so himself. And, it, it, and even though we can't see what's going on in those tricks, people are very impressed by it just tricks sleight of hand etc now I I can't really see what's going on with all of that but it's uh, something that's impressive and something that people like to watch doesn't mean there's anything wrong with watching a magic show of course but it has to do with the fact that people are impressed with miracles more impressed with a miracle than they are with the work of Christ on the cross the work of Christ on the cross was no miracle by the way that was not a miracle. That was Jesus Christ using the same spiritual life he's given to you. Do you walk around every day saying, I have a miracle? No! You have a unique spiritual life which is far greater than miracles! Far greater! Yet people are impressed with miracles. And that keeps many unbelievers from believing. Yet they will come up with the excuse... If only God would show himself, I would believe you're wrong. Just as the Bible says, if they did not believe Moses and the prophets, 
Why would they believe you or any miracle? And Moses and the prophets produced miracles. Apostle Paul himself produced miracles through agency of the Holy Spirit. Now Satan is specifically the enemy of the church. Specifically. He's an enemy of Israel. He's an enemy of uh, unbelievers. He's specifically an enemy of the church, the royal family of God, this new spiritual species, the body of Christ. And that is because God has done more for the individual believer today than he ever has before. The church age is unique, absolutely unique, because we are royal family of God. David cannot claim that. He can say he's royal family, which he is, but he's not royal family of God. He's royal family, royalty in Israel. But we are royal family of God, and we are part of our Lord's thir third royal warrant. What's that mean? What's the third royal warrant? has to do with the fact that Jesus Christ as king needs a kingdom. Jesus Christ as king needs royalty. He needs a family. And kings in the past made a big issue out of this. He said, I'm king, I need an heir. Well, Jesus Christ is king and he needs heirs and he has a lot of them today. Who are the heirs of Jesus Christ? Believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So his third royal warrant as king of kings and lord of lords means he needs royalty to be under him. So this is... The, the fact that we're here is a direct result of his strategic victory over Satan when he died as a substitute on the cross for us. Now we are left here to provide the tactical victory. It's opposite of the way most people think it. Usually in war you have a tactical victory, then a strategic victory. But in this case, Jesus Christ took the strategic victory, defeated Satan. It's over for him. And with us, it's a simple tactical victory. And that's how it's turned out. And maybe that's a way to tell us how to fight a war. Defeat them strategically first, then worry about the tactical things. In other words, nuke the hell out of them, then worry about what to do afterwards. Have a strategic victory first. Terrorists, dead. Now what? Take their oil? Okay. <laughs> now what? Do this, do that? Okay. But you've already had the strategic victory. And we are left under the great power experiment of the church age to fulfill a tactical victory. The victory's already won. We are here just to be witnesses of it. So these verses teach that Satan is an enemy of the church. Revelation 2 9. Revelation 2 9. Now there's a lot to this that you can't see just reading in the English. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. What's John saying here? Yes, some of you are poor. Yes, some of you have been afflicted and unfairly treated. But you're rich with what? The omnipotence of God the Father in the portfolio of invisible assets. The omnipotence of God the Son in the fact that He controls history and keeps the world spinning day by day. The omnipotence of God the Holy Spirit in that you have your unique spiritual life. That's how you're rich. People always talk about money, but this is far greater than money. So this is what he's saying. I know your afflictions, and I know your poverty, but you're rich! But they don't understand that. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Now, Revelation 2.9 is addressed to the churches. Now, why in the world would John say, I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not? Remember, Judaism was a big thing in those days. Circumcision, a big thing in those days. If you became a Jew, through circumcision, they would glorify you and say, well, you've done the right thing, brother, etc. But it was all works. 
And these people were not Jews, they were Gentiles. So it says, I know the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, they are Gentiles who have gone in for religion. What religion? Judaism. But are a synagogue of Satan. These Gentiles who were believers, they went in for Judaism. They circumcised themselves. They became a synagogue of Satan. We noted that in Galatians. Revelation is really not too hard to figure out. But they are a synagogue of Satan. And this is John talking about believers. Saying you're in the cosmic system. You're a synagogue of Satan. Yes, you've fallen, the, you've fallen into the Jewish religion, but religion has nothing to do with the fact that you're rich with the omnipotence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Revelation 2.13 says this. Revelation 2.13 I know where you live. We've heard people say that before. <laughs> I know where you live. Where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Apparently there was a great revival there, and Satan decided to live there for a while. Revelation 2.13 This is just to describe to you the fact that he's an enemy of believers. Definitely an enemy of believers who start living the spiritual life. And he saw that in this city, many people were starting to live the spiritual life, so he set up headquarters there. He said, I'm going to stop this. And you say, well, would he do the same thing today? Well, the church was in its early formation, and he did not want the church to get started. But since the church has already started and there are many, many believers, I think Satan may have changed his strategy now. Although I'm sure he sat around Baraka Church from time to time, seeking whom he may devour, seeking who he could uh, stir up against the colonel, of course. So Revelation 2.13. Now Revelation 2.24. Revelation 2.24 also explains how Satan is an enemy of the church-age believer. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. These are false doctrines. I will not impose any other burden on you. The reason why I said that is because they were holding firm to the faith rest drill. They were holding firm to grace, and they did not learn the deep secrets, or the so-called deep secrets of Satan, meaning they stayed away from false doctrine. But Satan was right there ready to give it to them. So Satan is the enemy of the church age believer. 2 Corinthians 2.11 In order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not aware, unaware of his schemes. 2 Corinthians 11.3 But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your right motivation and pure devotion to Christ. What's pure? You have sincerity. Sincerity is wrong translation. Stupid translation. Again, you can turn there. 2 Corinthians 11.3 Let's get this straight. But I am afraid that just as Eve was actually utterly deceived. But I am afraid that just as Eve was utterly deceived by the serpent's cunning. Then again, the composite of Satan. Deception. But I am afraid that just as Eve was utterly deceived by the serpent's cunning, your mind's actually thinking, your thinking may somehow be led astray from your right motivation. Remember the motivation? Love for God. Sincerity, what a bunch of bull crap. Sincerity has no meaning, really. People can be sincere about a lot of things. People can be sincere in the cosmic system. You can't really equate that with anything spiritual. That It means a right motivation. From your right motivation and pure. Do any of you remember anything about purity? 
Do you, do you remember anything about purify? Caparizo, purify. What are you purified from when you name your sins? The cosmic system. What does this pure refer, refer to? You living outside of the cosmic system. You living inside the divine dinosphere, the divine power sphere, the unique spiritual life from your right motivation and pure living in the divine dinosphere. That means you're up on rebound and you're not in the cosmic system. Devotion to Christ, what is that? Well, it's been distorted today. You can devote yourself to Christ every Sunday if you wish at certain churches. But it's meaningless! Devote yourself to Christ. Walk forward. Bend down at this box covered with white. And you will be okay. Devote yourself to Christ. All of you come forward. Lean on this table. Not too hard, it'll fall over. Lean on this table. And devote yourself to Christ. Devote yourself to Christ. Everybody, come forward. Duh. Devote yourself to Christ. Duh. It makes you feel like doing it, doesn't it? But what's that mean? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. What does devotion mean? Devote to Christ. What did Christ do? You have to think. The, the, the actual word thinking is in this verse. You have to think or mind what you think with your mind. Most people don't. Some people do. You have to think with your mind. And this thinking means what? In devotion to Christ, Christ lived the protocol or prototype spiritual life. Christ lived the prototype spiritual life. How do you have a devotion to Christ? You live the protocol spiritual life. He lived the prototype, you live the protocol. He flew and tested that plane and it could uh, withstand 100 Gs. Now he gives the plane to you and says fly it after teaching you how, of course. And you fly it through all the storms and adversity and it handles up very well. Why? Because it's already been test piloted and it can go through anything. This plane can fly right through a tornado and not even go through a spin. Just poof, right through it. I think we even have some jets that can do that. Just shoot right through a tornado and not even flip it or anything. You might feel a little jolt and that's about it. That's about how testing goes with us. You feel a little jolt but keep on going. And that is living your protocol spiritual life. Devotion to Christ, living your unique spiritual life. Devotion to Christ is not a one-shot decision. It is a day-by-day -day decision. Day-by-day. -day. You can't skip you can't skip one day and think you are devoted to Christ. In fact, to put it to you bluntly, you can't skip one minute and think you're devoted to Christ. Meaning, you must make sure in your spiritual life that you are filled with God the Holy Spirit and as soon as you sin, we all do, I do, we all do. But as soon as you sin, rebound! Immediately! You're going to be tempted and you're going to fall for it. We, we have within us an old sin nature. It's going to happen. But if we immediately name that sin to God, we're forgiven. Afi Amy. And not only are we forgiven, but we are caparizo from all wrongdoing. Purify. We become pure. And when we are pure, we can have that devotion to Christ. When we're not living in the cosmic system is what it's saying. This is technical. The Bible just doesn't throw out words for you to get emotional over, yet that's what most people think. These words are meaningful. Most believers will pick up a book from a bookstore and read it ardently and really get something out of it. Maybe it's a fiction book, but they'll read it ardently. Or even pick up a non-fiction book and read it and get something out of it. Nothing wrong with that, of course. But what do they do when they pick up the Bible? They get emotional suddenly. Let me turn here and see what the Bible says. Let me flip through. Home, home, home. Something from God is coming to me. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not as his father David had done. In everything, he followed the example of his father Joash. Now you might come up with something like that and say, that's what I need to be. I need to be like David. And that'll be your whole idea. Be like David. That's just emotionalism. 
You need to know the whole thing, not just flip through it and find something for yourself. That's stupidity. And God will not direct you to a specific passage. You know why? Because you need to know the whole realm of doctrine. You're insulting God. When He's given you every opportunity to learn the whole realm of doctrine, and you flip through the Bible just to find one verse that applies just to you. How arrogant. The Bible applies to everyone and to you, but you've got to know the whole thing. Beginning to end, dispensations and all. And we'll never know the whole thing until, well, we'll never know the whole thing, basically, but we can get uh, pretty darn close through our study, constant study of the Word of God. We'll always be learning until it's our time to go or until it's our time to stop learning. We will always be learning. That's devotion. It's not a devotional every Sunday. It's not a devotional at night when you read a part of Scripture, either. So you don't know what it's saying. That's what people say. I'm going to have my devotional tonight, and we're going to read uh, this passage. Well, they don't know dispensations or anything. What they're reading is gobbledygook to them. They don't understand it. They might as well read a horror book. They'll get more uh, excitement out of it. Because they don't know what it's saying. So, also, in Ephesians 6, 10 through 12... Satan is the enemy of the church age believer. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Finally, finally be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. And in his mighty power, what is his mighty power? He lived the prototype. The mighty power is the protocol for us because our Lord Jesus Christ has given us the same spiritual life He lived, which is phenomenal. The same spiritual life that took Him through all of that pain on the cross is the same spiritual life He's given to us. And very, very few believers understand that. Very few. Even believers who claim to be on doctrine have a hard time even comprehending it. Why? Well, there's a glitch where the filling of the Holy Spirit is concerned, obviously. These are spiritual matters. And if uh, somebody is not catching on after years and years and years, no filling of the Spirit, no teaching. You see, the Holy Spirit is our mentor and teacher, and He teaches us these phenomenal things. And if you've listened for 30 years and you're still not catching on to these phenomenal things, you haven't been filled with the Spirit. You've been dancing around in the cosmic system for so long you may never recover. It's sad. Not all baracas baraka. Not all doctrinal people who claim to be doctrinal are doctrinal. Definitely not. People who claim to be doctrinal don't even have authority orientation, which is the basis, the basis of the spiritual life. Humility! They don't have enough humility to come in out of the rain. They've got to be in charge. Superiority complex. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes, problem-solving devices. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. See, our struggle, while there's warfare all around the world today, and we are in a world war, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, although it may be if you're in the military, but what this is saying is our main struggle is somewhere else. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So again, we're attacked by Satan as church age believers. James 4, 6 through 10 gives us an extremely good explanation of this whole conflict and how we should handle ourselves in this conflict. That's James 4, 6 through 10. This verse always seems to fire me up. And it's amazing because James turned out to be a loser, but when he wrote this, he was definitely filled with God the Holy Spirit. And he tells us how to avoid Satan, and how Satan attacks us, and how to avoid him. James 4, 6-10. But he gives us 
more grace. That is why the scripture says, then he goes into the Old Testament, Proverbs. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now that's how you start out. Humility. What is it that will make the devil flee from you? Humility. What is it that attracts the devil and his system? Not the devil personally, but we're talking his system. What is it that attracts his system to you? Arrogance. If you're arrogance, you will fall flat on your face in the cosmic system faster than you can say cosmos. And that's the way most people have gone, even those who claim to know some doctrine. And you can listen to 20 tapes a day. That wouldn't give you much sleep, but you could do it. You could listen to 20 tapes a day. And if you're arrogant, not get a thing out of it! Finally, well, but he gives more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud. God opposes the proud. Now what happens if you go into humility as a believer? Humility means what? Submission. Submission to what? Authority. Submission to what kind of authority? All authorities. Authority of boss. When you're a child, authority a parent or parents. It depends today as much as family has fallen apart. Authority of grandparents. Authority of foster parents. Authority of whomever God has placed authority in the hands of. Then it goes on. Submit yourselves. What's that? Humility. Submit yourselves. Humility to God. How do you do that? By listening to doctrine without squirming. By listening to doctrine without resenting it. By listening to doctrine without trying to pick on something. And that humility, submit yourself then to God. Resist the devil. How do you resist the devil? Humility. If you don't have humility, you're in the cosmic system, period. And there are people who sat in Baraka Church for 30 years who never learned humility and have been under Satan's system all their lives and don't even know it. Oh, they know some things academically, but it doesn't matter until you transfer it into epinosis. And you might be able to talk a good fight, but you can't fight a good fight, I'll tell you that. And you come up with your own little taboos and your own little arrogance. Such as, if I catch you smoking, I will shove it down your throat. Or tear it up and throw it in the trash. That's arrogance. Yet people from Baraka have talked like that. People who have said they listened for 30 and 40 and 50 years have talked like that. What's wrong with that? No submission. No humility. You don't force somebody from their own free will to do anything whether it's sin or not smoking happens to be not a sin but if they were sinning you still don't force them to stop it's their volition and people who have come out of Baraka have, be, have been dummies even though they've listened and claimed to have listened day after day after day and they still un end up to be dummies. I understand it now because I've taught dummies for a year and a half and they were still dummies afterwards. Dummies, dummies, dummies. And why were they dumb? No humility. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. He's not going to flee from you as long as you're in arrogance. Verse 8. Come near to God and he will come near to you. What's that mean? Rebound. Wash your hands. Also a reference to rebound. Wash your hands, you sinners. Name your sins to God. and He, If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive. Afi Amy. Wash your hands is the first part of 1 John 1, nine. Look at this. I'm going to show you something that's never been taught before. I'm telling you, it's never been taught before. It's been taught in a way that now I can put it together. It's been taught by my pastor, uh, but not using this verse, but it's been taught in a way where the Holy Spirit has put it together for me. Now look, 
Wash your hands, you sinners. That's the first part of 1 John 1 9. If you name your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins. Afiemi. And purify your hearts. Last part of 1 John 1 9. Katharizo. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from what? All wrongdoing, the cosmic system. It's phenomenal. So what do you do? It, when it says and here, it's something that means it's happening at the same time simultaneously. When you name your sins, wash your hands, you sinners, you purify your hearts. Now that is, you were jerked out of the cosmic system for a moment. But then it has one last phrase at the end, which is something we need to take a look at. You double-minded psychosis, disukos in the Greek, according to Colonel Theme and Ephesians all the way up through. Nisukos in the Greek, double-minded. Now again, purify. That will take you right out of the cosmic system when you name your sins. But then there is your hearts added, which means your stream of consciousness. Now you're purified for a moment when you name your sins, but for people who have lived in the cosmic system all their lives, there's something else called a stream of consciousness. And in that stream of consciousness, if you have not been living your spiritual life, there will be a buildup of garbage, scar tissue of the soul and garbage. As a result, you will become double-minded. And when you are double-minded or psychotic, you're never wrong. You'll never be wrong. You can listen to doctrine, you can look at the verses, but you're still never wrong. Because the psychotic will grab on to the three arrogant skills and they never give it up. The psychotic grab on to self-justification, self-deception, and self-absorption, and they will not give it up. Oh, they know what rebound is. They've heard it. Some of them. And they name their sins to God, but as soon as they name that sin, they're right back into this system. They name that sin to God and get right on the phone and start gossiping. You know, Father, I have... A, usually it's an overt sin for them because that's what shocks them the most. Oh, Father, I've uh, committed fornication. Well, they've named a sin. They've been forgiven. And they've been jerked out of the cosmic system for a second... But then five minutes later, they call their friend and start gossiping. And they have a right to gossip. They don't think to themselves, I had a right for fornication, although they could think that. But uh, let, just as an example, I had a right to gossip, self-justification. In fact, they were all wrong and I was all right. Self-deception. In fact, it's all about me anyway. I'm going to do my own thing, self-absorption. And when you live like that, nobody can tell you any different. No pastor, God could come down and he's not going to tell you any different. And that's a fact. Because it's going to happen in the tribulation. And nobody's going to tell anybody that they're wrong when they know they're right. There's no talking to people like this. There's no yelling to people like this. None. People who live in this system, you as a believer should walk away. Now it's very frustrating, of course. It was so frustrating, my pastor would beat them up. The only thing they understood was violence, but guess what? After that violence, they still, they justified themselves even more. They went into self-deception even more and self-absorption even more. My pastor went out of fellowship. That's not the way you handle these people. You can't handle these people. God can't even. He'll go through warning discipline, intensive discipline, and dying discipline, and they'll still justify themselves and deceive themselves and be self-absorbed, even when God's dealing with them. So don't think you can deal with them. You can't. Don't bother. It's a mistake to do it. We've all made mistakes, of course. It's a mistake to go in that direction. Try to change somebody who's so locked into arrogance like that. But it is arrogance. It's people who are so dumb. Well, they might not be dumb. But they are... They might actually be smart. But they are so arrogant they can't...
can't they can't comprehend what the scripture is saying there's too much arrogance no filling of the spirit that's what James is telling us and the fact that you must purify your hearts you double minded psychotic psychotic the fact that the Bible says in verse 8 that they need to do this means that it is possible in very few cases for people to recover from psychosis simply from doctrine I mean, the fact that the Bible says it right here, for them to do it means it's possible. But rare, very rare. Verse 9, this is what is not rare. This is what is not rare. This is what usually happens to those who are double-minded. You know, he tells them, he gives them a choice and says, look, you double-minded, you have a choice. Fact is, they didn't take it. The Jerusalem church went down, down, down along with James they took him with him you hang around psychotic people long enough you'll become one it's best to separate immediately verse 9 grieve mourn and wail change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom why? they've been arrogant they haven't rebounded they're double minded they will not rebound they're always right they will not listen. They will not listen no matter what you say. They will not listen. They're always right. Continuing in James, verse 10, Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will lift you up. You are not promoted in the spiritual life until God promotes you. Humble yourselves before the Lord and He will lift you up. Not before people, before the Lord. Now, of course, there are systems that the Lord has given to us. For example, people are so dumb. I can't even, I can't fathom it. But for example, husbands are in authority over wife. Bible says so. You know, they even have a, a, a silly a nursery rhyme. I believe it because the Bible tells me so. How's that go? For the Bible tells me so. So little children, well, Jesus loves me because the Bible tells me so. Well, he also says, uh, husband is in authority. Why? The Bible tells you so. The Bible tells you so. And some wife could look at a husband and say, you're not the authority. God is the authority. Well, the Bible says the husband is the authority. Therefore, the husband's the authority. And it goes on. Parents, authority over children. Children, obey your parents as you would the Lord. Now, a child could look at his parents and say, and they probably will one day if you have this attitude, they could look at you and say, you're not my authority. God is my authority. Well, guess what? The parents are the authority because the Bible said parents are the authority over children. Now let's get down to where it hurts people. The Bible says pastor teacher has the same authority as an apostle. Now you could say, no, uh-uh, God's the authority. No, uh-uh, your pastor is the authority. If you don't like it, you can leave not confrontate or have a confrontation just leave the authority that is given in the Bible is for your benefit so what? for what reason? to humble yourselves if you could learn this on your own you wouldn't need an authority but the fact is God picks the weirdest characters in the world to be pastor teacher just look at me. He picks the weirdest characters in the world to be pastor teacher. For what reason? So that people can learn to obey an authority. Now that authority doesn't have to push his weight around. That authority simply comes from the word of God. And you don't question it. And if you don't like it, you don't have to show up. And a job, and the, uh, the pastor has a job to separate the wheat from the chaff as well, the wheat from the chaff, etc. 
and I'd rather have three or four, three, four, five, or six, than a whole group who are anti-authority and going the way of this nation. This nation will not survive. They don't even understand. It is unbelievable what people do not understand. It blows my mind. It really does. First Peter 5, 6 through 9 also talks about how Satan is the enemy of the church age believer. And he and Peter tells us how to avoid that. You know what happened when I started teaching Satanology? People looked into a mirror and got frightened of themselves. And said and took it personal. Oh, that's me. Yes, it is you. Now straighten out. It's all of us. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 9. It is you too. 1 Peter 5, it's all of us. 5, 6 through 9. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand. Look how Peter phrases that. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Notice back from James. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. It appears as if Peter had read James. And then he said, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you, lift you up in due time. Meaning your spiritual promotion will occur in due time. In due time, meaning at the right time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Now why now we've pulled that out as a promise and separated it from the other verses. But why do you think Peter throws it in amongst humility? Anyone under anxiety is arrogant. They are so arrogant, it's almost a form of legalism. What they're saying is, God can't take care of me. I have to worry about it and take care of myself. God will take care of you. It doesn't mean you shouldn't work as unto the Lord, etc. You've got to follow the other mandates as well. You can't go sit on a park bench and say, I'm not worried about it. No. You go out and do what you can in terms of job applications, etc. If your money's running low, and leave it in the Lord's hands, and definitely He'll provide. So continuing, cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. Why? In verse six, it talks about humble yourselves. Then it talks about anxiety. Anxiety is a part of arrogance, and most believers run through life with anxiety. Constantly, constant anxiety. And when they go under anxiety, what do they do? Believers. Well, let's take a pill. Let's have a drink. Let's relax. Now, there's nothing wrong with uh, alcohol in moderation. And in some cases, if a doctor orders you something, you have a, a, a mental imbalance. But for the normal person, all you have to do is claim these promises. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Now I say normal person not to be down on anyone because in our culture there's just about uh, 1% normal people. So you can look at me and say, you're the crazy one, I'm normal. See, and then people think in relativity. Be self-controlled and alert. Self-controlled. Be self-controlled and alert also meaning self-discipline. Be self-controlled and alert. I know a lot of people that aren't self-controlled. Your enemy the devil prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in faith. That's in doctrine. Doctrine today, doctrine tomorrow, doctrine the next day. Doctrine is never supposed to be number two in your life. And that's the whole problem with believers. People who go out and claim I'm so positive and love doctrine, they would rather sit around and watch cars go around in a circle than listen to a Bible class sometimes. Seen it happen. They would rather hammer a nail than listen to an hour Bible class. 
Seen that happen? Not as if they hadn't taken so many breaks. Well, they took a lunch break, didn't they? Oh, they sure did fill up their bellies. What about their soul? Not enough time. Not enough time. Got to get pissed off if you uh, call me out on that. I didn't have enough time. I'm working here. I'm doing this for blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah yourself right into arrogance. You have to organize yourself around doctrine. And if you do not do it, you're a loser. And you will have maximum shame at the Bema. You are not positive. You can claim positivity. You can run around and say you're positive. You can do all you want. But if doctrine's not number one today, tomorrow, and the next day, you're no, pos no more positive than the next person. If you think it's more important for something else, you're not positive. Just not. You're just not. It's a daily thing. As much as I've been studying the Word of God, it about makes me sick to think about the arrogance of some people. But that's the way it goes. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom, someone whom he may devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, standing firm in pistos doctrine. Because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Well, Peter said that. I don't have that much confidence. I don't think believers know that other believers around the world are going through sufferings. Much more sufferings than we have up until this point. They do not know. They do not understand that a Pakistani woman who wants to go to church, even though they might not be teaching much, they're teaching something that obviously Satan doesn't want them to hear. So she gets her legs chopped off. So instead of walking to church, she wills herself to church. And yet people have to make excuses about Bible class. I am not impressed with stupid excuses. I am not impressed with the stupid excuses people come up with why they cannot be learning Bible doctrine daily. And I don't mean showing up to Bible class. But it's a joke. Oh, I'll get it on tape. That's a joke for a lot of people. For some people it's not. It's, it's true. And I know the difference because I know the difference in their knowledge of doctrine. But when people start spouting off, they start showing how stupid they are and how little they know. Be best to keep your mouth shut all the time. But no, you're going to open your mouth and you're going to open it wide and some stupid things are going to come out and God's not going to be impressed. Satan is the enemy of the great power experiment of the hypostatic union, Revelation 12.4. Now that alone caused greater frustration for Satan than almost anything that had ever happened to him. Satan is the enemy, the, the greatest enemy against the great power experiment of the hypostatic union. That is Revelation 12.4. You can turn there, but uh, what you're going to find there is not what I just said because it's something that needs to be discerned. So I'll turn there myself so I can explain to you this verse. Revelation 12.4. We just looked at it a moment ago. I hate Bibles with all that junk at the end of it. As if I care. Revelation 12.4. His tail swept a third of the stars, angels, out of the sky, excuse me, and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. Reference to Jesus Christ. The woman giving birth, Israel, to a child, Jesus Christ. So he was a great enemy, the arch enemy of Jesus Christ. And the hypostatic union alone caused Satan greater frustration than anything that's ever happened to him. You know what that's saying? Satan was standing there at birth ready to devour Jesus Christ. God didn't let it happen, of course. But he was standing there at birth watching, eager, so eager. He knew the Messiah was coming. He said, all right, this is it. I'm going to seal this thing up and I'm going to win this thing right now. And he was so eager about it, he stood there and watched the birth of Christ. That's what it means. And he wanted to devour him right then. Now that wouldn't be fair. and It wouldn't be part of uh, the, the uh, trial. There would have had to have been a mistrial. And God said, you can't do that. You're out of order. If you do that, you're out of order. 
You've got to follow some rules, but you see, Satan doesn't follow rules. So in effect, he got other people to get involved. Herod. People like Herod, who immediately started killing children. That's all part of the satanic conspiracy. He started out as early as when Christ just was born. And he was under, and Christ was under constant attack from Satan from then on. Constant. From the time of his birth to the time of his death. Satan was right there. Watching. Waiting. Plotting. Scheming. Scheming violence. Waiting to do something. And that's phenomenal what comes out of Revelation 12.4. But what caused Satan the greatest frustration ever was what? The prototype spiritual life. He couldn't break it. Satan had all his wonderful systems set up and he thought, my systems will surely break down Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Surely I'll stop him from going to the cross, he thought. He thought, surely I'm smart enough to get now the humanity of Christ. You see, he's in hypostatic union. This is the doctrine of kenosis. He could do nothing from his deity to stop Satan. It's his humanity only. His humanity only. And from his humanity, he performed miracles with the power of the Spirit. He did not perform miracles from his deity. He could not have, because that's the doctrine of kenosis. That's taught by Lewis Berry Schaefer in Systematic Theology. I think even the colonel in the early years taught it a bit different, but it wasn't right. Kenosis means that Jesus Christ functioned fully on his humanity when it came to his spiritual life. His deity was doing what? Holding the universe together. His deity was making the sun rise every day. That's all the deity did. The humanity was the one that went through everything. And the humanity of Christ, you see, if we could have, if Jesus Christ would have performed miracles during, when uh, when Satan said, turn, this, uh, turn these stones into bread, if from his deity, Jesus Christ had turned the stones into bread, it would follow suit that whenever a problem arises in our life as heirs of Christ, we could simply perform a miracle. When we were hungry, boof, chicken, let's go eat miracle we would be able to do it but instead Jesus Christ performed under the prototype spiritual life executed the prototype spiritual life and gave it to us in the form of a protocol said it works what he basically could say to us is I took it all the way to the cross I endured the cross despised the, sh the shame and yet I had exhibited joy. With what? With his deity? No. With the unique spiritual life that you have. Arrogant people don't understand that. They're still functioning under legalism and don't even know it. They don't even know what I'm talking about when I say prototype and protocol even though I've taught it and taught it. I know people that don't understand it. The prototype is what Jesus Christ lived on the earth in his humanity. He executed the prototype. It defeated Satan. And when we live the protocol, we defeat Satan in a tactical victory. Jesus Christ completed the strategic victory. When we execute the protocol plan of God and go to play Roma to Theu, maximum glorification of God, we've won the tactical victory. And that's where we need to move. And if we don't move there, our nation is doomed. Our nation may be doomed anyway, but you need to move there for your own sake. At least the angels will be cheering, even though New York may be up in a big bomb. We are entering into very, very serious times because there's no pivot. We're entering into a middle age type situation. When the Roman Empire fell, there was a thousand years of pain and suffering on the earth. And unless there's positive volition that rears its head somewhere, when the United States falls, there will be pain on the earth for a long time to come. Unless the rapture occurs first, if that occurs, there will be intensified pain on the earth. Until the millennium. But you have a choice to make in 
you here have made that choice to go with the spiritual life and to make sure that you live this protocol that Jesus Christ has so graciously given to us. A spiritual life that was able to withstand all the pressure of the cross has been given to you. The very power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead has been given to you. It's phenomenal. And yet people can't humble themselves enough to just sit down and listen. It's absolutely phenomenal what we have. And it's absolutely tragic that very few people give a damn. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God, the Holy Spirit, enlighten us concerning the things we've noted related to this unique spiritual life so that we can humble ourselves before the Lord and so that we can grow in grace and in knowledge and so that we can execute this spiritual life and so that when the testing comes, Satan will flee from us and we will win the tactical objective we will win our rewards, given to us by you, of course, so that we can hear those wonderful words, Well done, my great and faithful servant, in whose name we pray. Amen.